Okay, let's get right back to our special guest, independent black ops contractor Cody Snodgrass, who has uh, retired, was at it a long time, and knows a lot of different things. And what we have is a, a story that may sound implausible to some of you, but in this day and age, not much does anymore. Uh, Cody was offered $1 million to blow the Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City. And this was done, if you didn't hear it, out in the middle of a forest or a wooded area. The offer was made. Somebody had a backpack with a half a million cash. The other half million was due on completion of the job. And Cody said, no, no, thank you. And that turned him into an immediate liability. And we know that the Intel people don't like liabilities. As we look back on Oklahoma City, on the OKC bombing, did you spend much time tracking it, following it, or did you try to put it out of your your consciousness as much as you could and get on with your life? Well, no. It it was something uh when I was offered that job to uh to bomb that building, I immediately was revulsed by it. I didn't want anything to do with it. Mm-hmm. And I told uh contractor that was there that, that that did it. I just told him I'll just tell you the story. It was in October of uh oh nineteen ninety four. And Harold Leonard, he's deceased now. All right, what were you doing, uh, minding your own business uh, when this uh, offer was made to you? Give me the background on that. Yeah, I've been in black ops for a long time, almost 20 years. I was about to retire. In fact, I did retire in um, 1995 in March. One of my civilian covers, I was a petroleum geophysicist for Amoco uh, Production Company. Very good cover, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was a real good cover, but um, I was working on my master's degree in physics down in uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and worked there in the early 80s, and then that was our cover for operations over in Arkansas when the Clintons were there and everything. But you fast forward through all those, and we're up to 1994, I mean, October, and Harold Leonard called me one day, and uh, he said, we have a job for you. We went out in the woods and, and get away from all surveillance and everything, and he said, we have a job for you. And I said, what country are we going to? I thought it was going to be in Saudi Arabia or something. And he said, no, it's here in the States. So I said, what kind of job is it? And he said, it's an EOD job. Uh, it's an uh, explosives and demolitions job. And I said, uh, what kind of what kind of op is it? And he said, it's a building. He said, uh, it's a federal building. And I said, what? And I said, which one? And he said, the Alfred P. Murray Federal Building. And he had a uh, backpack purple and black backpack that had half a million in cash in it and he said there's half here we'll pay you half when the job's done and you can have whatever you need you know to get it done and i was getting towards the end of my career and i had severe ptsd and i'd actually died in the hospital twice i was getting to the end of my career and i couldn't take this stuff anymore i was having bad dreams at night and i just told him i said this is our own country and i'm not going to do it there's no way i'm going to do this i turned down that job and that was a point at which i turned from an asset into a liability. Cody was offered the job, as you just heard. All right, you said no. Uh, you turned from an asset to a liability, a long-term asset as well. If you're saying you're getting close to the end of your career. So what happened next, Cody? After I turned that job down, there was about six more months. And by 1995, in March, I had my retirement party. You know, I made up my mind I'd never go back to that kind of stuff. I wanted to kind of turn my life around and get get back to the light more. So then in uh, April 19, 1995, uh, the building went off. And when it did, I immediately went black, so to speak. Uh, we had false IDs and uh, disguises and so forth. We had had a network. I used to be a geophysicist uh, for Amoco Production Company in Tulsa, Oklahoma, mm-hmm. but we were running black ops over in Arkansas in the early 80s, 82, 83, 84, 85. One of the ops was Centaur Rose was the code name, you know, Rose for the Rose Law Firm. Oh, I was going to ask you if this had anything to do with Clinton's or Rose. Wow. Yeah, it did. There's uh, There were three ops there, uh, Centaur Rose and uh, Jade Bridge and Screw Worm. Anyway, they had the ops there in Arkansas when uh, Bill Clinton was governor, and uh, Centaur Rose op was the one where arms were taken down there to covertly arm the uh, Contras, and then uh, 
the drugs were brought back, cocaine, to uh, pay for the op because they could, you know, this was an illegal domestic op, and they couldn't go to Congress for money. So that's how they funded it. In the meanwhile, I was a geophysicist over there, and we were working in that op, uh, and we had a network of, uh, you know, safe houses and so forth there. And the guys I was working with had worked for the CIA in the Vietnam War, after the murder building went off, I went down there to our series of safe houses, and I hid out for a while. I was afraid they were going to kill me because I knew about the op and turned it down, and I was a liability. Cody, and a question, the, please. No, the safe no. houses couldn't have been run by the people who would have tried to kill you. Who, who put these safe houses? I don't want names. How did these safe houses come to be, and were they actually safe from the black ops machines that you were worried about? These guys were really good for Vietnam. They'd been in a lot of ops over there, and then they came back to the States, and they were working in the ops over in Arkansas. The safe houses consisted of farms. You know, one one had an airstrip. So they set them up uh, independently of the government or the intel agency community, all that. They, they needed their own place to go. So like a, a group did this for their own self-protection. Well, Obviously. sure. Any any time you're running a black op, the less knowledge about anything, the better. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of black operators don't even trust anybody. I mean, if they're if they're on a sanctioned CIA op, a lot of times they won't trust any of the own guys that are with them because there's always intelligence leaks. Things can happen, so they always set up things for themselves. Usually, that, that, uh -huh. that no one knows about, uh -huh. no one can trace. And it's a safe house. It's a place where you can go and be safe from all the, the long reach of the, uh, you know, the black community. Got it. Very good. Well, you answered the question perfectly. Thank you for that. Okay. So, uh, you went to safe house after uh, the Murrah blast. Things had cooled off. By that time, they had indicted Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols for the bombing. They were actually the patsies. They had like their patsies. Said. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, like you said before, the, the bomb, the, the building was pre-wired. And those bombs were there, already installed um, by another black ops team. And mm -hmm. McVeigh was the patsy, so with the Ryder truck. And when right. he was going to pull up about 9 a.m. on April 19th, 1995, he was going to detonate that bomb, and that was the cover for the op. In other words, Jeff, when uh, an op like that goes off, it's going to be very public. There's going to be a lot of press, a lot of firefighters and uh, people. And so when you have a very public op like that, you have to have a cover for that op. And the cover was the rider truck that was going to detonate and be the, uh, you know, the patsy and the lone bomber to cover up the fact that that building, they were going to be detonated simultaneously. But what happened, two of the bombs didn't go off. And that black police officer you're talking about, you couldn't remember his name earlier, his name was Randy Yickey, and he had been a, a MP before in the military. Right. Yeah. And he got out and was working for the Oklahoma City uh, Police Department. And he was actually the first responder. He was down on Northwest 5th Street in downtown Oklahoma City in his patrol car, and he'd stopped someone on a regular traffic stop, was given a ticket, and when that bomb went off about 9.02, 9.03 a.m., and then he went running, and he was the first one in that building, and there was a lot of people, a lot of stuff going on, and he rescued four people that were bleeding, and right. he won the Oklahoma City Police Department's Meritorious Conduct Award for uh, saving civilians. And then during the course of that, he went in a daycare center uh, trying to find some children and help them, and he discovered those unexploded bombs, one of them. So they didn't detonate all the way, and so now they had another cover-up they had to do. When he saw that unexploded bomb in the daycare, he immediately began to know that there was something fishy going on. Oh, yeah. And yeah. W when you're doing a, any kind of terrorist that do operations and, and blow buildings and stuff, they always consider the psyops, the psychological effect on the civilian population in the area. Mm -hmm. And so the, the daycare bomb, if it didn't have any structural reason to be there, you know, like the beams in the building, uh, the main reason to put the bomb in daycare is because they wanted children casually so that they could use the emotional peel. That's what, what terrorists do. They, they try to cause maximum carnage and maximum damage to get the the biggest emotional response. I mean, it's a horrendous thing, but that's how that's how these these satanic people think. The black police officer in the nursery, and the idea was that that nursery was supposed to be obliterated and all the children gone, just just wiped out. Was the entire building supposed to drop? Was that supposed to be part of the game? Yes, absolutely. There were 
three main charges. Uh, they were all supposed to detonate uh, simultaneously at the same time that Timothy McVeigh was going to set off that rider truck. They didn't know that those black operators in there, they had two ops. He was supposed to pull up there and do that, and then the guys on the inside had their own thing. And McVeigh was the cover. He was the patsy. When they offered me that job, I immediately knew it was a patsy job because a million dollars, I wouldn't even consider doing a, an operation like that for that kind of money. That's ridiculous. Anyway, Randy Yeeke found that bomb, and he began his own investigation. And over the years, he interviewed a lot of witnesses and talked to a lot of people, and he collected about nine file boxes of various forms of evidence about that. And he was warned off by his commanders in the Oklahoma City Police Department to not pursue this. The FBI offered him a cush job in uh, Dallas to uh, stop what he was doing, and he was a patriot. Uh, like me. Eventually, uh, Randy Yeeke, uh, he fell into quite disfavor, and they just flat out threatened him and said, you need to stop this stuff. And he had another friend that he made copies with of those records, and he was getting scared towards the end. He, they took the, another copy of the records, and they put them in a uh, safe deposit box in one of the banks downtown there. And so one day, uh, he told his wife, Tanya, he said, uh, I'm going to take all this stuff out of here. I'm getting nervous. Uh, and he went up to Kingfisher, Oklahoma, and uh, he had them in his patrol car. And then he was going to put them in a storage room. A little while later, after he had lunch there, this was on May the 8th of 1996, there was a patrolman. He was a Canadian County Deputy Sheriff. His name was Mike Ramsey. And he was out driving around doing his normal uh, driving around one of the uh, – prisons up there and he found Yankee's car sitting out there by a field and the trunk was open the door was open and he pulled up on it and it was covered with blood he called it all in about 40 or so law enforcement officers all descended on the area there was state highway patrol Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation, Canadian County deputies, they all looked and they found Randy Yeeke's body. Uh, he was several, uh, quite a ways from the car, and he had been cut up. He had l uh, multiple cuts all over him, contusions. He had been beaten, and he'd also been shot in the back of the head. And so they looked around for his service revolver, his pistol was gone, and they looked for it and couldn't find it. And so uh, after close to an hour of all these police officers wandering around, trying to find the, the gun. I mean, there was a gunshot to the head. Then uh, a black helicopter came out of the FBI office in Oklahoma City, and uh, in that chopper was the FBI's SAC. That's the uh, strategic area commander. His name was Bob Rick, and there was a couple other guys with him in that chopper. And when they were there for about five or ten minutes, all of a sudden they found the, uh, the gun. After 40 or more trained police officers had looked for almost an Got hour. It. So Yiggy had died, and then the guy that he had given the other copy of the files to, mm -hmm. uh, his name, I believe, was Dr. Jo Don Chumley. That was his name. Anyway, he had uh, a single-engine civilian aircraft, and he was uh, taking those files somewhere to put them up, and his plane crashed exactly the same day on May 8, 1996. Well, we must honor uh, Randy, and I'm glad you were able to fill in all those blanks. They just, they just kill off everybody who's a liability, as you said in the very beginning. But I just wanted to say something about that cover-up you, know, you were just talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a massive cover-up, and one of the reasons the Oklahoma City Police Department covered up Randy Yeeke and, and helped the FBI was because the FBI had been conducting undercover investigations. There were some of the officers inside the Oklahoma City Police Department prior to the bombing that had been dealing drugs. And the FBI had evidence on them. And so when the FBI needed help covering up this thing and, and putting out the cover story that McVeigh was a lone bomber, they uh, leaned on the Oklahoma City Police Department and told them, well, look, if you don't cooperate with us and help us squash down this investigation and make all this stuff go away into a black hole, then we'll indict your uh, people for, uh, for drug dealing. So it was actually a blackmail thing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But the problem, the main problem they had is that the two two other bombs did not detonate. And now the feds had to go in there and cut and remove those bombs. Plus the main reasons, the real reasons why they actually ordered that bombing up in the first place. Um, it's pretty astounding stuff. Now they had to 
go in there, not only remove those bombs and hide them from everybody, but they had to get rid of what they originally wanted to destroy in that blast. That's why we had reports of people carrying a lot of stuff out of the building. Yes. I can tell you the real reasons why they bombed that building, if you'd like. I would like, yes. Why the bombing? I have to go back to just a little bit of history so uh, listeners can understand, because this is very, very important to our country. Okay, so if you go back to January of 1991, that was the Gulf War. Previous to that war, Saddam Hussein, he was a CIA asset, he had been engaged in a war with Iran, and Iran had enjoyed a 10-to-1 infantry advantage, and we were always over worried about the, the Iranians overrunning our, our asset, Saddam. Uh-huh. And so we secretly, covertly, in the Reagan administration, we, uh, we armed Saddam with the Ames strain of anthrax, and that came out of Fort Detrick, Maryland. It had a small four size and a uh, different protein code is a weaponized version of anthrax which would uh, be more readily absorbed and so we gave them that covertly he never used it when he invaded kuwait we had to demonize him and stop him the saudis were putting a lot of pressure on us so we went in there uh, in desert storm and uh, went to re- uh, remove him uh, from kuwait and our Pentagon, they were all afraid that he would use that aim strain of anthrax on our own troops. I'm going to try to go through this, and it's just a little background. We'll get to the This is fascinating. Here. They didn't want to admit to the American people they'd given them this stuff. And now that we were going in there, they had to come up with a vaccine of our troops. It's normally a six-month injection, uh, where you, course of injections where you take one shot per month. And we didn't have time to wait six months. I got yep, it. They created a new vaccine that only cre- that went one month, and they got Bioport and some of these other companies to make it. They waived FDA approval. They hurried our troops through there. They gave them these shots. The first lot went to Dover Air Force Base. The pilots were all getting sick. It, it, this new thing had squalene in it. It's an adjunct. It's an autoimmune booster, very similar to the Therosol, which is a mercury-based thing in the uh, right. flu shots, or the aluminum. Yeah. Wow, this is mind-boggling what you're telling us, Cody. Go ahead, okay. please. Okay, so now they gave this new vaccine to our troops. It was untested, and it led to what was generally called the Gulf War Syndrome. Uh, people were getting sick. Yeah. Um, nobody knew why. And then the second thing that happened in that war, that was the very first time our military had ever used depleted uranium weapons in a war. And we expended approximately 200 tons of it, primarily in the A-10 Warthog tank buster uh, jets that use the 30-millimeter chain guns. Uh-huh. And they used depleted uranium-238. Our M1A1 Abrams tanks, which, by the way, Tim McVeigh was a tank commander in Desert Storm. He won a Bronze Star for com- confirmed kills. Mm-hmm. But those M1A1 Abrams tanks had Sabbat rounds in them. And they had about an eight or nine inch rod of depleted uh, uranium 238 inside of them. And they had a very high kinetic energy, about 5,200 feet per second. Those uh, rounds hit Soviet tanks. And they had enough kinetic energy to blow an 11 ton turret just clean off. Saddam was using those T 54 Soviet tanks. And a brand new thing happened that had never happened in war before. And this depleted uranium cloud. Uh, this explosion was forming new compounds like uranium dioxide. When these particulates settled down, the micron size of them were four millimeters. Now, our standard military mop gear, the filters on them only went down to 10 microns. So our troops began breathing this low-level radioactive particulates, and they went through the filters, and they accumulate in the human body in two basic places, in the thyroid glands, and in the ovaries, if you're a woman, or the testicles, if you're a man. Oh, my God. Now, when our troops started coming back from Desert Storm, mm-hmm. they were sick from the, the squalene adjuncts in these new experimental anthrax vaccines, and they were also carrying inside of them low levels of depleted uranium. Now, what do soldiers do when they get back home? You know, they see their wives, and they make love and have children, And what the Pentagon was worried about, this is the first time this ever happened, the semen in the men had radiation in them, and they were being transferred into Mm -hmm. the women. They were getting sick. The children were getting sick and having failure to thrive syndrome is what the Air Force called it. And the Pentagon, Jeff, 
but they didn't know how many generations this sickness was going to be transferred. And so they potentially had on their hand hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars of long-range medical bills. And so a few years after the war, 1994, there was uh, Chris Shays. He was a senator on an armed services committee from uh, Connecticut. And he was uh, tasked with determining medical culpability for the Gulf War syndrome of all our uh, troops. We had approximately 480 troops and all the branches of service coming back, and a lot of them were sick. I know, Jeff, you've heard about that Agent Orange thing and the big DuPont settlement. Well, this was something potentially bigger. And so Senator Shays said we need to determine medical culpability, and we're going to request the FBI to gather all the records of these people so we'll have medical files and we can give them money. Well, guess where the medical files were stored? Oh, no. Oh, this is sickening. God. In the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building. <sighs> now, I got one more bombshell here. <laughs> so let's just think about that for a minute. I mean, think about what's going on here. It's a, it's a Pentagon cover-up. The mop gear was defective. Our troops got sick from that depleted uranium. This is unbelievable. Yeah, they call it Gulf War Syndrome. And oh, they sure. Laid it off, yeah. They laid it off on Saddam burning. You know, he lit those oil wells in Kuwait on fire and all this other Well, stuff. we supposedly blew up some of his uh, wep- weapons, chem weapons dumps, too. It's all crap. And so when all those medical records went away, okay, in the Murrah building blast, yeah. So there was a hearing later on in September the 19th of 1996. This was a congressional hearing on Gulf War Syndrome after the Murrah Building records had been lost. And at that hearing, the DOD admitted under oath at the hearing that over 400,000 Gulf War Syndrome records of our veterans had, quote, disappeared. So without the record, they Got didn't it. give out the money. Boy, Meanwhile, uh... our guys were getting sick. Now, you want to hear the second reason why the Murrah building was blown up. That's bad enough. Go ahead. Jesus. Yeah. Well, that's what happened. That's why they ordered that op. The second one has to do with corruption of uh, Mr. Clinton, Bill Clinton, Mm -hmm. um, and Hillary Clinton. And this went back to Centaur Rose, Screw Worm. They were three multiply nested ops uh, in Arkansas back in 82, 83, 84, 85. And to make a long story short, we were arming the Nicaraguans with a lot of weapons. Uh, and Barry Seal was a contract pilot, CIA. He had been in a 20th Special Forces group back in Fort Benning in 63, took his training, went to Vietnam as a pilot, came back, and accepted CIA ops in Arkansas. And he was running uh, the Mena Airport there with a front company called Rich Mountain Aviation. And so he, they were all bringing the cocaine back to pay for this. And uh, yeah. they were running approximately $100 million a month in coke through there. My sources told me that Bill Clinton and them were getting about $10 million a month, 10% of the op money. And um, wow. he later used that money to go run for president. But anyway, there had been a large contingent of law enforcement agencies that had gotten wind of the CI covert operations there in, around MENA. And uh, the Arkansas Bureau of Investigation, the state police, the DEA, the IRS, they were laundering this money through the banks in Little Rock and the Worthington Bank in Atlanta, which was sent overseas to the Caymans uh, at a bank called the BCCI. That's a bank of commerce and credit. Oh, yeah, Arizona. BCCI. Oh, I know. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, all this ties into this stuff all later on. But anyway, to make a long story short, they had a lot of law enforcement records there, okay? And they were all being stored in the FBI office in Little Rock. Prior to the Murrah building bombing, there was a police detective in Tulsa, where I used to work, um, named Craig Robert. He got a call from an FBI agent who would not give his name, and he told him that all those law enforcement records had just been moved to the Murrah building. <laughs> <laughs> and so when it blew up, okay, all those records that could have been used to indict Bill and Hillary Clinton, uh-huh. they were all gone. And you remember in July 26 of 1994, that's when the Whitewater investigation began. Uh-huh. And then in August of 1994, that's when Ken Starr, you remember him. Sure do. 
he was appointed to the as a whitewater prosecutor to replace that Fisk that Jan- Janet Reno had had appointed. See, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. Clinton had had got Janet Reno as U.S. attorney, and then they appointed Fisk to help cover all this whitewater stuff up. Yeah, and that's why they put Ken Starr in there because they knew the investigation had been rigged. So this whole thing gets real deep. And we have a lot of detail in the book. Where is the book available, Cody? I, I've got to give that information out. Yeah, is... well, I just have to explain, Jeff. This is, book is different from a lot of books. Um, most publisher, most people that write a book, they go to a publisher, they get it published, yeah. and then they go out and start doing interviews. This book was about black ops, and I was afraid about writing and exposing things. I had to uh-huh. do everything the opposite. I couldn't approach a publisher with this because I was afraid they'd rat me out to the CIA, and then they'd shut the whole thing down. So what we have to do is interviews first, the book later. What we have now is CD copies, edit copies, and we're under negotiation with several publishers uh, for the rights to the book. But we do have some available through my website for people who want right, this to give uh, Please give that information out now. I'll tell you right now, this is without question one of the most important books of my professional career that I have ever come across. And he said this goes deep. This really exposes the whole horror of the Clintons, the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein. My God, the, the depleted, I was on the depleted uranium story very early on, Cody. People can contact me there. We'll tell them how to get the book there. All right, my email is C-O-D-Y, Cody, Golden, G-O-L-D-E-N, Elk, E-L-K, at yahoo.com. Got it. Cody Golden Elk. I'm part Cherokee Indian, and that's my Indian name is Cody Golden Elk. What can these people do who have been contaminated, who are dying right now? They're still radioactive. This stuff doesn't go away. That's that's not the way it works. In that the government would never even admit that these people had been dosed with radioactivity. What could the VA do, even if it wanted to, without ex- assuming liability and exposing the government to full liability for, for turning our men and women into radioactive uh, s- sacrifices? This is what they did. Right. It, the problem is actually much bigger than that. I've got multiple degrees in mathematics and physics and stuff like that, and I can get pretty technical with all this. Just in layman's terms, well, one of the secondary part of this was that, as you said, those nanoparticulates, they were deposited in the area, wherever these battles were. And then later on, our troops might go through that same area right. on a different operation, and the half-tracks on the tanks and the yep. choppers would yep. stir this dust back up. And these guys, uh, a lot of times, weren't wearing their mop gear, and they're breathing this stuff straight in. And then the other part of it, they had a cover up with the United Nations because this stuff was all getting into the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And those rivers were used to irrigate the date crops in Iraq, one of their biggest exports. They have like 20 some odd, I think it's 26 kinds of dates that they export around the area. Those dates were beginning to pick up this radioactivity. And then about 10 years after Desert Storm in 91, Right around 2001, when the Twin Towers came down, these U- UN reports came out, and there was a 600% increase in leukemia-type sicknesses in the children in Iraq. So it wasn't just our soldiers. It was the people there and the suffering of those children there. So, so it wasn't yeah. just uh, uh, overdosed, hyperdosed Fallujah. It was into the ground, into the irrigation water, into the agrarian crop. Of, in this case, it's dates. So we right. we literally destroyed the whole country. Oh, uh, it's not only that. We had also sold uh, Saddam, and he had acquired uh, from the Russians, I believe, other types of uh, biologicals, like the sarin and the tabin gas. They were stored at the Kamasia facility in Iraq. Uh-huh. And the, the, the sarin is a trimethyl ethyl thi- thiocholine-based neurotoxin. And when our forward observer teams and stuff went in there, um, they were sniffing. They had all their sniffers and their chemical gear on. It turned out that some of the crates in that Kamasia depot, it's a huge depot, they were actually marked with U.S. markings. And so they wanted to destroy that evidence to uh, cover up that we had given him Supplied all these covert him. arms. So they detonated that, and they didn't put it out on the radio. 
it was a covert thing where they just went in and said, look, we got to get rid of this evidence. They detonated all that stuff, and it made a big plume of air. It blew miles. I remember. Troops, uh, no, yeah, yes, I remember yeah. this. Troops that were down downstream, they, they breathe that stuff, too. So this whole area, Jeff, it was it was this, this big toxic soup. And the guys came home. They, they labeled it Gulf War Syndrome. The records were put in the Murrah building, and it was detonated just before the big hearing. So that was the main cover-up. That's the reason the American people haven't been told this stuff. We armed Saddam Hussein covertly. Another way we armed him was with the Hawkeye 123 cluster bombs. The CIA copied our patents on those, and they covertly took them down to a place in Argentina, and they hired a front company to begin building them and sending them to Saddam to arm him. And there was a component in them called zirconium. It's one of the uh, key components, and it's on the State Department's banned export list. So they had to fake a bunch of files through the Agriculture Department and get the zirconium out of our mines down there to them, too. So that was another covert arms thing that they used. So there was all this covert black ops, shadow government stuff going on that none of our people were told. And that's why I wrote this book, is to try to, to get the truth out to the American people and our veterans. My father was at Pearl Harbor. I, all our troops and all our guys are suffering while all these politicians get rich off these wars. The story about what really happened in Benghazi, I people that were right there on the ground, CIA assets, uh, that's an amazing story they told me right to my ear. But, yeah, anyway, that's the reason they bombed the Murrah building. And then that, there was a big cover-up with McVeigh later, and he was sent to the Tenth Circuit Court up in Denver, and he was sent in front of Judge Richard Mach. And meanwhile, there was me, who had operational knowledge of that, and the uh, ATF DEA had begun an undercover operation in 1997 in Colorado Springs called Operation Stingray. And I had met undercover agent, ATF agent Blake L. Butler. He was at the Waco Branch of Indian Compound. He was also mm -hmm. at Ruby Ridge. Mm -hmm. He was also supposed to be working at the Murrah Building on April 19, 95, when it was detonated, but called in sick. And so I met Agent Butler in an undercover fashion, and I sold him some legal guns. And then on April 22, 1999, two days after the Columbine High School shooting, it was the worst shoot, uh, shooting in U.S. history, uh, Bill Clinton and Janet Reno came up here, and uh, they were talking on the TV, and I was sitting around with Blake Butler. I did not know they had undercover 4 millimeter cameras. And he asked me what I thought about them. So I made the mistake of blabbing my mouth, about all these CIA ops in Arkansas with Bill Clinton, how they were pedophiles. I talked to Kathy O'Brien, the CIA sex slave, blah, 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 and they recorded it all. Oops. So then they planted me with evidence, okay, mm -hmm. and threw me in prison, and the judge that they threw me in, in front of was Judge Edward Nottingham in the Tenth Circuit, and he was nominated to his position by ex-director of Central Intelligence, George Bush. Now, the United States Attorney in the Tenth Circuit was none other than Tom Strickland, appointed by Bill Clinton. When Clinton first got into office, he fired every U.S. attorney and put his own guys in there because he knew what they'd been doing in Arkansas with all these drugs and arms, and so he was stacking the justice system. He was the first president to ever do that. And so they ramrodded me through there, and then there was another guy named Kerry James Gagan. He'd been, he was a CIA asset like me, and he had been given a bunch of C4 plastic explosives to drive from Denver down to some contacts in Trinidad. When he got down there, there were three guys that were Middle Eastern guys, and he saw in English they were plans of the Murrah building. So he got spooked. He thought he was going to get set up as a patsy, and he drove back to the Secret Service office there in Denver. And he told them, the con uh, CIA found out about it. They planted his house. They planted him with evidence, and they threw him in there with us. And so I was in there, three cells for McVeigh with Kerry James Gagan. They had all three of us that had operational knowledge about the Murrah building right there. Now, meanwhile, Tom Strickland had been in a law firm with Brownstein, Hyatt, and Faber. And turns out Norman Brownstein in Denver, he had once been on the Council of Six. They were the attorneys for the CIA back in the 70s when Bush was there. So this, oh. this whole thing starts coming together. Now, they executed Timothy McVeigh on June the 11th, 2001. For Kerry sure, Gagan. for sure, uh, Cody. Uh, he's gone. McVeigh, 
people still talk. They say, nah, they didn't really kill him. The newswoman said that she saw the sheet still breathing. Cody, do they kill him or not? I'm going to tell you what I know, and this has never been out in public before. When they took him, I was there that day, they took him out of there. And then he had to sit on death row. They went to the FCI, that's a Federal Correctional Institute in Terre Haute, uh, Indiana, uh-huh. where they had the new death chamber. And so uh, he was there and got executed. Now, about two weeks after that, I was in the FDC, the Federal Detention Center in Inglewood, Colorado, and Denver. And my uh, one of my cellmates was Chris Holsinger. And Chris Holsinger had an attorney named Nathan Chambers. And Nathan Chambers was the last attorney on the McVeigh case. They tra- changed attorneys several times. Well, Nathan Chambers had went to the execution chamber and held Timothy McVeigh's mother's hand on the front row, and they watched him get the shots through the glass. Right. Okay? Now, two weeks later, I was in the FDC legal visit room, and I walked up and approached Nathan Chambers, and I said, hey, are you McVeigh's attorney? And he said, I was. And I said, well, did you go to that execution? And he said, yeah, I was sitting on the front row holding his mother's hand. And I said, what was it like? And he turned his palm out to me, and he covered his face, and he put his head down, closed his eyes, and he shook his head, no, and he just turned around and walked out of the room. So what he witnessed was evidently something very bad. Like I said, I I wasn't there, and I did not see it. I've heard stories that, you know, they gave McVeigh sugar water and all this stuff, and they didn't really kill him. Um, I don't know. I don't have any actionable intelligence. Except That's a very interesting uh, gesture he made. Whoa. Yeah. What's your best yeah. guess? Well, my best guess, I was there with him. He was upset, very upset. Uh-huh. I don't think he was a civilian attorney, and he'd probably not been in the military, never seen a lot of people killed or anything. And most people who would sit and watch yeah. something like that, yeah. that's got to be ugly and horrible. Plus, holding the mother's hand while yeah, the son yeah, got yeah. killed no, it's ugly. A, emotionally way over the top. Yeah. So he, Nathan believed, I think, that, that, that he was killed there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's all I know. That's all I know. And the CIA approached McVeigh, and they wanted him to, to uh, use the special forces as a front and be an agent for them. And he was to bomb buildings and assassinate and move drugs. And McVeigh was a patriot. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. And he quit the special forces. Hmm. And after that, he went up to Calspan uh, in Buffalo, New York, as a security guard. And during the Desert Storm, when he got his standard shots, now we're back to all the shots and the anthrax shots and the squalene, yeah. there was a covert program which was testing implantable microchips that the Pentagon didn't tell anyone. And this test was to test, test these chips in a real-time battlefield condition. And so McVeigh was given a microchip without his knowledge. And he went over there to Desert Storm, and Lockheed Martin had these satellites. They were the Battle Engagement Area Tracker System, the BEAST system. And they were tasked with uh, observing uh, soldiers and the microchips and how they worked in real-time battlefield conditions with dust and soot and so forth. And so when McGay got back, the protein code on this chip failed, and he got sores on his butt. And he had it removed, and he got angry that the Army had actually done that to him. So he wrote letters to his sister Jennifer, and I have copies of them. Uh, Because Jennifer, later on, when he was charged with the bombing of the Murrah building, um, the the FBI took all this stuff. So most people have never seen it. But I got the actual – I don't have the actual ones, but I got copies of the actual letters. And McVeigh – uh, you know, he complained to his sister that he'd been given. He was furious. Oh, yeah. He was furious. Yeah, yeah and that, that, that the CIA had wanted him to use the special forces and do all this bad stuff, and, and he quit it all. So he went to Calspan, and that was a big, big military contractor. They were into microchips. They were in the Redstone uh, Air Force program with uh, telemetry and electronic countermeasure systems and all that stuff. And I think it was there that he was approached. Uh, with a job, you know, for that. Uh-huh. And also what a lot of people don't know about McVeigh, um, I had a friend named Ron Cole that was at the Branch Davidian compound, and uh, he, he was a really good friends with David Koresh, uh-huh. and his mother got sick. And he went to Florida, uh, take care of his mother, and the very next day, the shootout at the Branch Davidian compound happened. So Ron flew back. By that time, they'd set up a perimeter, 
And so all the Branch Davidians that were not in the compound, they were outside watching. They set up tents, and they're watching this every night. And so around the compound at night, there were these black choppers with no markings. They were 204 Hueys, not, not Blackhawks. Mm-hmm. And they saw streaks going down to the, to the roof, and they were the standard uh, tracer rounds. But these civilians didn't know. Mm-hmm. And so they said, we wish we had some night vision. And some guy showed up. And he goes, I've got some night vision from the Army. And so they could sat and watched it all, and they asked him what his name was. And he said, I'm Timothy McVeigh. Hmm. They watched them machine gun up that thing at night. And here's why they did it, Jeff. That's a standard Delta Force tactic. When you're surrounding a building Uh and there's insurgents in the building, Uh you always deny the higher levels of the floors. Okay, so they have to go down low. Drive them down, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then that you can collapse the perimeter closer to the building. I got if you. If the snipers are up high on top, they can shoot further. Mm-hmm. So you you take out the top, and then you collapse the perimeter. And so what happened there was night after night they watched this. Yeah, they were sta- seeing the standard. See, we didn't hear stuff. about any of this, of course, on the no, outside. No, 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 no. This is all covered up because the feds had to conceal the fact, just like the Oklahoma City bombing, same pattern over and over uh, with these ops. Uh, so they had murdered most of the Branch Davidians, and they were down on the lower floors. And after 54 days, uh, you know, of that uh, of that situation, um, then uh, they burned the building down to cover up the crimes. This man is bringing his truth forward so that all of us might learn from it and that perhaps we might have a better chance at saving what's left of the United States of America, our great republic. We have been lied to and deceived as a matter of course, probably from the beginning. It's just the way governments seem to work. Uh, What is it about the value of human life that gives the dark ones, the evil ones, such an advantage over those of us who treasure and appreciate life so much. They they seem to be beyond psychopathic, Cody. I don't understand that kind of a mind. I think intellectually I can, but I certainly can't spiritually or emotionally understand it. It, it just doesn't work for me. They don't care about life. Yeah, that that's exactly right. How do these people, to the best of your ability, Cody, look upon the value of a human life? How do they process it mentally? What goes through their minds? Yeah, it's a it's a very cold clinical. It's just like a, a general, you know, when someone says, "Sir, there's a you know a division of NBA up on a hill," and then the general looks at it and says, "All right, well, what's uh, the estimated casualties if we take it?" And you know they'll say, "So many men." And then they go get coffee and uh, say, okay, we'll just do it, you know, and there's so many thousand people that are going to die. And then they go play golf or, or whatever they're doing. And it's it's like um, it's a distance. It's a um, seeing from a long way that cold, clinical, icy, non-detached, uh, non-human. And that's what I've, I've found with uh, in the black ops is people do get like that there are some good people that really care and like me the patriotism overrode you know money and all that other stuff well that's why you turned down the offer to blow the mirror building uh right you're a human being still yeah it's compassion you know uh if there's a spiritual light within you you know love compassion understanding caring forgiveness unity consciousness type of thing that that uh spiritual light is is what separates us and normal good people from these uh these monsters and and people like bill and hillary clinton myself uh i never met them personally but i had an op several times asked me do you want to meet them do you want to meet them some of the friends i worked with met them and all that i never wanted to i, I would always say no i don't want to be anywhere around them because they have that it's it's a it's almost like a satanic ability to detach well, i think but it is yeah. a satanic ability i think you just put your finger on it but they 
can also smile and, and make you think you're the only person in the room and uh, that they really connect with you and they really love you. All that is is giving to get something. Behind it is selfishness. Behind it is evil. Behind it is hatred for life. Um, I don't understand how in good conscience the government, the people that are in the government, people in the Justice Department, can let this stuff go on. It's so obvious that they're murdering people to protect themselves while they're smiling to the American people's faces. And they're going to Haiti and saying, oh, we're here to help the children. I saw a picture of Clinton down there loading water uh, down. This was so staged, the photo op. Um, Haiti's a hot place. There's a lot of humidity. And he was on the in a cargo door of a plane, and they had a stage crowd. It was all these women and children, and he's loading bottle uh, cases of water down to the poor, defenseless people. And right. uh, you know his his sleeves are rolled up, and there's no, you know, no sweat, no nothing. They just staged the whole op, uh, the picture, to make it look like he's helping the people. It's all such lies. Well, their career is built on uh, stage photo ops and and stage. Life period. They're all, they're gangsters is what they are. We'll have to wait and see. They've got so much dirt on so many people, Cody, and you'd know more about this than I, that they, they feel untouchable. Okay, let's go now back to OKC, to the Murrah building. Anything that we need to clean up there or, or rephrase or otherwise represent for our listeners tonight? That was a false flag off. The, the building itself had had been the repository of over 400,000 medical records of the Gulf War syndrome patients, all of our uh, guys in the military and the women too. And then also, according to Craig Roberts, the Tulsa police detective, uh, he got a tip from the FBI guy in Little Rock that all those files, for years they'd been investigating the Clintons down there. CIA had been running uh, covert ops in MENA to arm the uh, Nicaraguans and then bringing drugs back to pay for the ops. Uh, they couldn't get money from Congress to do it due to the Bolin Amendment. And so the ABI, IRS, all those guys had, had been collecting records over years. They were all um, stored in the Little Rock FBI office, and it was just before the Murrah buildings that they were moved over there. And then uh, there were three bombs pre-wired in the Murrah building. One of them only detonated. They were all set to detonate when McVeigh pulled the Ryder truck up there. Now, that was the cover. This was a black op, false flag, but it was going to be real public and messy. There's no way they could cover it up. They had to have a cover story, and the cover story was the Ryder truck. Well, two of the bombs didn't detonate, so now they had another cover up, and they had to first clean up the explosives and the undetonated ordnance, and then they had to go get the source original reason why. They had to move those records, and that's what Ole Domagard was talking about. Uh, they had another team of guys in blue suits that were hurriedly put together because they weren't expecting to have to move those records. All that stuff was supposed to be destroyed. Right. Then they had to get a team together. Then they had, That's why they collapsed uh, the perimeter. I mean, they pushed the perimeter out. There were firefighters and people in there trying to rescue people, and the feds pushed them all out and said, get out of here, pull back. And they said, why? We want to help the people. Well, they were having to move all those records that did not get destroyed out of there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they didn't want the people seeing what they were doing. And after they got the records out, then they let all those stuff go. So they d- deliberately let our people die. They deliberately put yes. bombs in yeah. the daycare for the psyops to kill children. And if you remember, Jeff, they had that uh, that famous uh, Time magazine where that fireman's carrying the mangled baby out. Yes, sure. Yeah, that's the standard psyops. Mm-hmm. They blew that all over the news. They used media propaganda to cause emotional turmoil to the civilian target population. It's a standard terrorist psyop technique. Um, And that way, when you're all horrified, uh, you know, it's horrible to see that. It it does something to your mind. It disjoints it. It disconnects it. It triggers the cognitive dissonance threshold. Exactly. And, And your mind blanks out. 
It's horrible. It's terrible. And then this helps cover up. No one wants to investigate then because your mind's full of these bad emotions. It's horrible. And all you want to do is get away. You don't want to look at it anymore. You, you no. don't want to look at it. The picture that you're talking about won a Pulitzer, by the way, uh, as a, a classic news photograph. Uh, I think it won the picture of the year, Pulitzer Prize, for that particular photo. Fireman carrying a, a little uh, baby uh, out of the daycare. The, the other issue is after the building was blown. And I watched this, and you did too, and, and many of you listening remember this, how the media was used, and within a, literally a matter of a couple of days, the word patriot was turned into the, one of the most dirty words in the English language. They turned that word inside out. McVeigh, patriot. McVeigh, terrorist. They, they ran these words together, and it, it just... There were no patriots after that. That, that people went underground. They didn't yeah. use that term. That term was turned into dirt. We talked about how I'd been offered that job, and then the decline. Uh, I was hor I, I was ready to get out of all that messy stuff. Turned it down, and then I went black after it happened, and went down there to our old safe houses that were used uh, around the Centaur Rose Ops over in Arkansas, between Tulsa and uh, Oklahoma City. Uh -huh. And I had a fake ID and, and disguise and everything. I didn't. Want, I thought they'd kill me. But um, I, what we did when I first got down there, right after that happened. Um, we were watching the civilian newscast, the propaganda, as you're talking about. And every single story, Jeff, it started in the morning, uh, and then the new news, and then the five. Every single story started out. Oklahoma City bomber, Timothy McVeigh. Oklahoma City bomber, Timothy McVeigh. They were saying that over and over. This is before he was ever even indicted. They didn't formally charge him even. Not yet. Yes. And this was the propaganda tool <laughs> used by the deep state on the civilians to get it in your head that he was the Oklahoma City bomber. Yeah. And the whole thing was part of the PSYOP, just like the uh, baby. Uh, and, the, and, you know, it's all terrible and horrible. But in the book, we have detailed eyewitness accounts of uh, all kinds of things. It's There's just so much it's hard to get into in this short time. But the, the PSYOP was on. On, the cover-up was on. Yeah. This is a combination of media control, black operations, um, and, and shadow government chicanery to cover up one of the worst medical scandals and the worst um, crime syndicates in Arkansas with the Clintons and the CIA. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was a massive, massive cover-up on many levels. Now, what I'd like to do is move to Waco and talk about Janet Reno. That story has a lot of uh, interest to this day. I still remember the uh, ATF guys going into that second, I guess it was the second floor. They got up on the roof and crawled in that window. There were four or five that went in, and we learned shortly thereafter that two or three of them, or four of them maybe, were killed when they went in that window. <laughs> Now, that, that raised red flags in my mind immediately. So what the hell? Why did they go in there? And why are they dead? So were there are reasons. And we want to talk about that and then about what was going on in the days up to the conflagration in which what was left of humanity at the, the Davidian compound was executed, murdered, uh, annihilated. So tell us about the ATF agents who went into that window and, and uh, several of them died. What happened there? Well, when we were up in the middle of in 1997 in uh, the ATF DEA Operation Stingray, that's where I first met uh, ATF agent Blake L. Butler. He was using a fake ID called Daniel Bo Boyette. We nicknamed him Bo. But he, was, he had been at the Branch Davidian compound during the shootout. And we have proof of that because we went through some video footage and we found him. He was one of the guys, the agents on the stretcher that was carrying those guys that first went in the window you're talking about and that got shot. And we have some clear pictures of him. He was also at Ruby Ridge, Idaho. He was supposed to be at the Murr building the day it was bombed, but uh -huh. magically called uh -huh. in sick. So... Uh, 
we had heard that uh, a couple of those guys had been Bill Clinton's bodyguards. Um, and they had recently been transferred over to ATF. And it just so happened that they were the first ones sent in that uh, window. Now, it looks to me like this is a classic cover-up. You don't have to kill someone like the Clinton's machine does to murder the, the eyewitnesses to their crimes. But if you send them into a hot LZ in a hot place where they're uh, risking getting killed as much harder, you just let the situation kill them. And I think that's what happened. These two guys probably saw Bill Clinton. They were in a position to witness some of these sex crimes. And um, then they were immediately transferred away, sent in the harm's way, the very first ones in the window, and then they got shot. I think that's one of the ones we have a picture of Blake Butler carrying them out. This is another cover-up in the middle of this. But um, I had a friend. Uh, he was an associate. His name is Captain Glenn Wilson. He's deceased now, so I can use his name. Right. Did two, two tours in Nam, and then he worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, on, as a liaison. And I know, Jeff, you probably know a lot more about this than me, but in 1979... The Ayatollah Khomeini over in uh, Iran had, uh, with Islamic fundamentalism, overthrew the Shah of Iran, mm -hmm. and they uh, surrounded our embassy in Tehran and overran it. And Glenn Wilson was part of the DIA's war planning thing, a rescue team. I think it was Operation Condor, Operation Eagle Claw. I can't remember once which one. It's in the book. But that, uh, he was part of the planning thing to get that. And I had another guy in the Office of Naval Intelligence that was at the Iranian embassy when all that happened. But you fast forward through 79, and then Captain Wilson, when he uh, got back from Nam, he went down to Dade County, Florida, and got the job as Nonoc Narcotics. He was the head of Nonoc Narcotics. And back then, that was the big cocaine capital and all the stuff going on. And Janet Reno... Uh, at that time was the uh, district's attorney. And so my friend had uh, coffee with her. They would go out and make bus and bring the evidence in, mostly cocaine, some heroin, to the DA. And um, he would sit and they'd go over the bus and all the stuff, the logistics that happened the night before. And he told me that on several occasions, Janet Reno went down into the evidence room where the drugs were they just brought in. Uh -huh. And he saw her take out uh, cocaine, and mostly cocaine, but some heroin. And I said, well, why did she take evidence out? And he said, <laughs> that she, well, she, that she was a lesbian, and, you know, she was uh -huh. ugly. And the way she got her girls was to give them drugs. That's what he told me. Mm -hmm. And he also mm -hmm. told me that on politically sensitive cases, um, people that were connected up, that, that she ordered them to destroy the evidence and lose it and forge the paperwork. So the cover-up machine that she would later do with the Clintons up in Washington as United States Attorney General regarding Waco was already in the works down there. And so Janet Reno was... Uh, you know, just a cover-up artist, and uh -huh. very crooked and very dirty. And then she oversaw the Waco Branch Davidian fiasco. Now, Bill Clinton was calling the shots to her, and she was the front. Clinton didn't want the political blowback from a domestic op like that that could turn bad. Sure. And so uh, he had Reno uh, run in front for him. In case anything soured up, they'd throw Hunter, her under the bus. There are 13... Clinton bodyguards, uh, at least, who died uh, under various circumstances. That's an awfully high mortality rate. This is uh, on the Clinton death list, which you can find online. They actually have the bodyguards separated out into a, a group. Uh, I remember after Waco, not long after, I've forgotten how many, was it one or two, fell out of a helicopter in a, an alleged training operation out over the Atlantic. Remember that one? Yeah, I heard about that. It's classic. It's the classic deal. Yeah, these guys are so dumb, they fell out of a helicopter. Uh, it just goes on and on. Then you fast forward to Seth Rich, another guy. Allegedly, he went to the hospital and was alive. Died four hours later in the hospital. He did, they didn't succeed in killing him on the street, apparently. And several of the reports have it that he, he did, in fact get transported to the hospital and, and was alive for a while there. But yeah, I don't know. These, these stories are planted. All right, so Janet Reno would help herself to the Coke stash 
so she could get laid, so to speak. Well, why am I not surprised? Okay. Yeah, that's what Captain Wilson told me. Uh, mm -hmm. I had, uh, before he died, uh, he had Agent Orange cancer, very bad, sad, sad thing uh, in his neck and throat from drinking that patty water over there and all. But he's a good friend of mine, and I did some uh, secondary uh, ops for him with uh -huh. the Defense Intelligence Agency and also uh, personal ops. Uh, and he was a good man, but he told me all this stuff. I don't doubt his word at all. I mean, he was a good American, he just, just straight up told me the truth about her. And he said she's one of the dirtiest people. He said that she was, she had that detached, satanic air to her that, I mean, she was like self, just selfless, just but right. evil. Right. I think evil is the, the operative word here for many of these people. And think about Ron Brown, uh, stepped across the line. Uh, became a liability, and they took a whole airplane of people down to get rid of Ron Brown. Don't forget about that one. Another Clinton death list, and they should put everybody who was on that plane, including the stewardess who survived and was extracted by a medevac uh, helicopter, an American helicopter, but golly, by the time it landed, she had died of a, a severed a femoral artery that they cut on the way. They killed everybody. And Ron Brown was found with a, a hole in the top of his head going down uh, into his brain. So that's a rather unusual plane crash injury. They just don't, they just don't care. You get in the way, you're gone. That's it. Well, that's what we ho hope to change, okay? Because I used to be an operator, all right? And I trained in martial arts 20 years. I've had a lot of training, been a lot of... Ops. I'm here to tell everyone, the listeners, everyone out there in America, you know, these people, they have a lot of power and they control the, the judicial. But um, I'm just here to tell them that, that, that we're not going to take this anymore. I'm not going to. I have roving bodyguards out here. They're driving around this in trucks. I have uh, people out in the woods. I live in a very remote cabin, four feet to the National Forest. Uh, we do have snipers out in the woods right now watching this place with night vision equipment. And they're, if they try to come in here and stop me, they're going to have a problem. And we don't care who they are. What I'm saying is, Jeff, is that there are countermeasures. A lot of these people that were killed, like Seth Rich and them, they, you know, Vince Foster, they were politicians and attorneys. They were not seasoned operators. Mm -hmm. They were not like Captain Wilson, uh, combat veterans that know their way around this stuff. You look at the Clinton death, death uh, list, and it's a lot of civilians and people that don't have training. It's time for us to rise up, prepare ourselves, learn these tricks of how they murder the witnesses and they control the narrative and stop them. Amen, Cody. Uh, I'm not going to let them do that to me like they did to the rest of them. Um, I went to my doctor before we started this and gave him a whole list. I said I, I signed a deal saying I'm not going to commit suicide. I'm not going to take any drugs. I have diabetes, so I take the drugs the doctor gives me. That's all they're going to find if they do a toxicology report. Um, I'm not going to go out and have a car wreck. I stay right here in the house. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, it's going to be hard for them to get to me while I'm telling the truth like this. And I appreciate your show to get it out. But there's techniques we all can use to stop this satanic evil in our country. May I mention one thing? I'm, first of all, very glad to hear, I'm not surprised, that you have taken more than adequate precautions while you're doing this program and others telling your story. Uh, once it's out, it's out. And that'll give you a measure of safety, as we've discussed off air. Uh, you're a pro. They know that there's going to be real trouble if they try and mess with you now. Uh, this story is, is, is going to go all over the world, uh, and it's going there right now as we speak, in fact. And I'm, well, Jeff, Jeff, if yeah. they offered me the, bomb, the job to bomb the Murrow building, yeah, yeah, okay, what do you think I'm capable of doing? Okay, I'm not going to be treated like those witnesses. I want Bill and Hillary Clinton to know their game is up. We will rise up. If Trump doesn't do it, it's going to get done another way. I had a chance, I'll say this over the air, I had a chance at one point with a 99% operational chance of success to kill both Bill and Hillary Clinton. 
uh, I would put the operation, if I had have done it, at 99% success rate. At, at the conditions at the time, uh, we, uh, I didn't do it. Uh, but I, I'm just telling you that they are not invincible, and the same techniques that they've been using on all these witnesses and all the, the Jennifer Flowers and all the blackmail and Paula Jones and Monica Lewinsky, all the tricks they've done to hush these people up, that they're not going to work anymore. We're not going to let them. It's time to take them down. Uh, and I'm not the only one. Uh, there's, I think that there's going to be a lot of things happen here real soon in our country, and and I think there's going to be some justice done, um, hopefully. But um, I, I let them go that time, and uh, they don't even know it, which is classic black op, just like the Murrah building. So we're not going to do it anymore. Uh, we're not taking it anymore. I'm not alone. I have a, a lot of people I know, and they are very tired. They're patriots to the, of the United States, and they will, they're, they're really tired of this stuff they're pulling. Wow, that's really music to my ears. Well, I'm saying it's, it over the air it's because time. It's, it's true. Yeah, it's, uh, there, someone has to stand up to them. Uh, my uncle was at the Battle of Bulge in uh, World War II, and he fought over there. Wow. My dad was at Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. and, and we have to fight. The, they had to fight the evil of Adolf Hitler. You can talk to him till you're blue in the face. They're psychopathic satanic evil you cannot talk to them you cannot reason with them you have to stop them with force period the clintons are the same way they will continue their writhing sneaking little games and washing money through the clinton foundation and conducting blow-up ops for their records so nothing will ever the whitewater investigation will never make they're going to keep this up and keep it up until someone stops them Accountability. Everybody out there needs to get ready because this, this in our country, Jeff, there's mm -hmm. a civil war brewing. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it never gets to that, but there's a battle between the light and the dark. Yes, there is. Uh, you're 100% correct. Uh, it's been brewing for a long time. I think it may be actually closer than many listening uh, would imagine it to be. It is time. We are at the end of the line, and I to hear you say this, uh, gives a lot of people hope that there might at last be some real accountability. The Clintons seemed invincible, you know, with Hillary being in Secretary of State and all the crap and embodied Benghazi. Wait till you hear the yeah. story about Benghazi. It made me, when I heard this, it made me mad at what the Hillary had done. It made me boil inside. And I got it straight out of the horse's mouth from a guy that was in a firefight at the embassy in Benghazi. Uh, the people need to hear this stuff. All right, we're going to get there. I want to mention one other thing. Before she was Secretary of State, the, the word was she was flying out to Los Angeles about once a month to participate in some of the satanic Luciferian rites and rituals and events that are constantly staged in uh, in the liberal Hollywood elite echelon, shall we say. That wouldn't surprise you, would it? I have something to say. I don't... Uh, uh, since we're on a civilian newscast, I just, uh, I'll just say it, and I'll try to use the right words, because uh, I don't want to... But uh, with this one person, one of the uh, the CIA persons was Kathy O'Brien. Um, you know, she right. wrote the book right. Transformation of America. Right. And I held her hand and, and was talking to her, doing a kind of a healing thing with her. And she wrote about this in the book, but she also told me straight to my face. One time she was sent down to uh, Arkansas. She was a presidential sex slave model programmed in the uh, Monarch and MKUltra CI mind control programs. And Kathy O'Brien was really pretty. I thought she was a beautiful woman, but her mind had been messed up. Anyway, she would sit down there to have sex with uh, Bill, and her story was that Bill got done with her, and then uh, there was a woman's house that they were using, and so Clinton could come in and out the back door, and this woman then called Hillary and had said, hey, come on over, and handed the phone to Bill, and he said, yeah, yeah, come on. This is a good one, and so Hillary came over there. They had Kathy there in bed, and uh, 
on the inside of her labia, you know, on the right side, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in her, her vagina, mm-hmm. they had put a mark. It, it's a it's a goat's head. It's a satanic symbol. Right. And they had put like a tattoo in there. Mm-hmm. And when Hillary Clinton got down there to do her business, she saw that and and got wildly excited because of this death, this uh, devil's worship symbol there. And she goes, oh, my God, I love this. You know, and that's the story that mm-hmm. Kathy O'Brien told. So she's satanic. Now, we also want to tie in Pizzagate to this. It's, it's all part of the same thing. The International Pedophile Network is not extraneous from the government. It is part of the governing process, sad to say. What can you add to that? Well, it's more part of the dominance and power. You know, if you have uh, power over somebody sexually, that gives you a thrill. But if it's over a defenseless, innocent children, that's even more. You have the fear and the power. They feed emotionally, okay, off of fear and and domination mm-hmm. and power over others. That's why they naturally migrate to positions like Secretary of State or or the President. These people are evil, satanic beings. Their spirits are of the dark polarity, and they they love uh, children. They love controlling them, mm-hmm. and they love mm-hmm. the whole thing. These people are not normal. And the sad thing is the average rank-and-file American who gets his or her, quote, news from the mainstream media is getting no news except propaganda and mind control. It's all imagery. It's all projected. It's all carefully contrived. All of yeah. it. And Nothing is black... left to chance. Nothing. Right. And in the, I'm sorry to interrupt. In the, right. in the black, there's a little delay here, but in the black ops community, we got to see, I didn't see everything, of course, but I got to see things from the ground that, you know, they figure you're one of them, just like those bodyguards uh, at Waco. Right. They figure you're one of them and loyal to them, so they don't have to hide their true selves around you. So we got to see a lot of stuff like that. Uh The people out here, all they see is staged photo ops like that thing in Haiti with Clinton loading and helping the people. It's all staged. There's makeup. It's fake. The whole thing is fake. They hide behind the offices of the presidency or secretary of state or whatever. They hide behind the light. They hide behind the truth, and then they conduct their slithery, uh, satanic stuff. And we're here to expose them uh, about the murder building. I personally believe, although I do not have actionable intelligence, okay, I, it's my own personal opinion and belief that Bill and Hillary Clinton were directly involved in the bombing of the murder building and in its, its subsequent cover-up because... If, if that investigation is ever reopened and uh, the, the operators and people that helped remove those records when the, the two bombs failed to detonate, mm-hmm. those were operators mm-hmm. like me. Those were black ops people sworn to secrecy. They probably had to sign point-specific national security oaths for that op. Mm-hmm. They might have been contractors from overseas. But those people there saw that. They were in the middle. I'm asking you guys to step forward now, please, wherever you are, and help bring the truth like I am. Step over your fear of death. Uh, you know, my fear of death is only surpassed by my love of freedom and truth. Very eloquently stated. Um, I remember after the Murrah building bombing, and I wondered at the time, if the other bombs didn't go off, was somebody going to hang for that? That's a pretty big screw up, isn't it? Well, yeah, if, they, if, they, if I took that job to bomb that building, I guarantee you those, those wouldn't have went off. Um, whoever did that was not a professional. Who, whatever happened uh, on an op like that, especially a domestic op. Mm-hmm. I mean, you go overseas, you've got a little fudge factor. You can lay it off on the Shining Path or Al-Qaeda. You can, you can mess up ops, and you have more cover, uh, you know, to, to leeway. It, here in a domestic op like that, everything had to be precise, everything. And they screwed it up. So here, whatever happened there um, was non-professional. I remember uh, General Ben Parton. I think Parton. 
deceased now, General Parton, was one of the first people to come out and say that that was just total crap about the uh, Chuck bomb. And I think he was one of the ones who first pointed to the, uh, the seismology readouts showing several explosions there in quick succession. At least two. Boom, boom. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. When I was in at Amico for my civilian front, I was a petroleum uh, geophysicist and then a research geophysicist. I had about 19 guys, people under me. Right. Uh, that was my front. and But we did seismology. And so I'm an expert in that. And I looked at the, the seismology reports from the University of uh, Oklahoma there, the geological deal. And uh, the waveforms... Uh, yes. show two distinct waveforms. What Correct. that meant yeah. Yeah. was when an explosion goes off, there's a compression wave. It's generally a, 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 a longitudinal wave. That's a wave where the direction of energy is exactly the same as the direction of motion of the wave, okay? And so those were two f- uh, forms like that, but one of them had the sharp frequency characteristics of C4, because it makes a certain waveform when it detonates. Mm-hmm. And then the other one was a much slower, longer frequency, uh, which was the ammonium nitrate and diesel. That's a big push. It's like someone putting their hand on your chest and just kind of gently pushing you. And then the C4 detonation is like someone taking a, a ice pick and just poking you real fast. Got it. And so, that, and so there was proof that there was two forms. Another thing that happened was they got residue samples. See, when... When C4 blows at 26,000 feet per second, that's its detonation rate, mm-hmm. it leaves a residue with the RDX, and you can scrape it off plate of things later. They sent that to the FBI lab, and the guy that was running the FBI lab in D.C., he was the head guy. He said, uh, I got his name in the book. He, um, he said, this is the biggest terrorism case in U.S. history. I want to do this forensic analysis personally to make sure the truth is there. Well, you know, the, the government's cover story, Jeff, was that uh, ammonium nitrate and diesel and the lone McVeigh thing, that was the cover. Well, they had to maintain that. But guess what they found on the residue samples sent to the forensic labs in, in, uh, to the FBI? They found C4 over and over again. <laughs> when the, when uh, uh, McVeigh was first arrested, mm-hmm. they took his clothes and bagged them. They, t- they sent those clothes to this FBI lab. They found C4 residue and ammonium nitrate both that that fits with the two signatures from the from the uh, seismographs there were two different bombs one inside the building went one in uh, in the truck and the other two didn't explode and guess what happened to the guy that ran those tests they ordered him to doctor his reports and only put the ammonium nitrate as huh. the explosive uh-huh. and so he they fired him because he wouldn't go along, and then he went to Congress to blow the whistle, and they had sealed hearings where he told them there was C4 in there. There was C4, and they sealed all those hearings because it didn't fit the cover story that McVeigh was the lone bomber. Yeah. I mean, I, I, this book's full of details like that. A lot of people don't know this stuff, but I'm an I'm a explosives expert. I could talk for days about all of this stuff. It's, it's General Parton was right. It was a massive, massive cover-up from top to bottom. All right. You people, in almost every instance, are the difference. You're what's left. You care. You're not one of the sheep with your smartphone plastered up against your head trying to initiate a brain tumor. Uh, you care. <laughs> and that's no joke. Here's the here's the story. You take this information and you change your life and you endeavor to make a difference. You endeavor to persevere along those lines. We have no choice. And I don't want to get into the the Muslim immigration issue. Uh, we've seen what's happened to Europe. The same thing is scheduled to happen here. You've got to stand up and oppose the things that are anti-American and designed to destroy what's left of our republic. And that's what Cody is doing, and I, I couldn't salute him any more highly. Now, if we can, Cody, just uh, three or four more minutes on, uh, on Waco, and then let's move to Benghazi after that. Those people at Waco, many were already dead. The public didn't know it. There were, I guess, Hueys overhead. Uh, every night, firing. 
uh, into the building. People were dying. Uh, and at the end, when they were incinerated, uh, there were a lot of dead people in that building already. Tell us uh, a little roundup and a wrap-up of uh, Waco, and then we'll go to Benghazi. Okay. Uh, yeah, I knew a guy named Ron Cole. He was a Branch Davidian. I'm not a Branch Davidian, but he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very close to David Koresh. And the day before the compound was hit, um, he had flown down... Um, well, it was two days before it was hit. He, his mother was sick in Florida, and he flew down there to take care of her. And then the next day, uh, the compound was hit by the feds. There was a shootout, and so he saw it on the news right when it happened, and he called before the feds cut the phone lines. And he talked directly to David Koresh, and Koresh had just been shot in the shootout. This is what Ron Cole told me straight to my face, Okay. And I don't think he has any reason to lie or make any of it up. Okay. Um, so Ron told me that um, Koresh told him that the ATF pulled up in front in uh, trucks with uh, big, long cattle trailers and that the branch of Indian dogs at the compound, and they were unmarked. No one said a word. The dogs just ran out and started barking at the trucks. And the ATF agents shot the dogs and then started shooting at the ho at the thing. There was uh, evidence to uh, support this later on, mm -hmm. but that Koresh had got hit. Later on, the feds cut the phone lines, and then they set the perimeter up uh, so they could conduct their business. Well, right. Ron, he flew back immediately, and by that time, the feds had the perimeter around the compound, and many of the Branch Davidians that were out shopping that day or went to Waco for uh, things, um, they came back, but they weren't allowed in. So no, they, start, they got mean. camps, and they watched. At night, they saw the black Hueys. They were unmarked, uh, no lights, and they kept seeing streaks coming down, you know, the orange or green. Uh, and so uh, they didn't know what it was. They were all civilians. They're not used to night ops. And they one, one night they said, hey, I wish we had some night vision. And some guy came walking up and gave him some military night vision mm -hmm. so they could watch it all. And then McVeigh, uh, it was actually Timothy McVeigh there. And he wow. explained... Yeah, he was just back from Desert Storm mm -hmm. in 1991, and he had come down there. And what he explained to him was, he said, look, I just got back from Desert Storm. I want a Bronze Star. I'm a tank commander. Um, this is a standard technique, Delta Force technique, um, when you have insurgents hold up in a building, and there's the snipers and, and shooters always go to the top because they can shoot further. But you deny the top ground and you push them down to the lower levels so that your perimeter team surrounding them on the outside can collapse the perimeter and get closer. That way they can use small arms like grenades and so forth that they couldn't use from a, a uh, further away position. Got it. So they all watch this in horror. Night after night, according to Ron Cole, um, these Hueys came in in the dark at night, and all they saw was the, the choppers and, and the streets. They machine gunned that compound completely up. They murdered most of the Branch Davidians in there. They all, had, by that time, had gone down to the lower floors. And uh, then the tanks were called. Ann Richardson was lied to the governor. And they went and got uh, tanks off of the uh, Fort Hood base. That's where my dad took his, his basic training for uh, for Pearl Harbor. I'm be done. Fort yeah. Hood, yeah, they got the tanks, they, and they waited 50 days or so. Mm -hmm. Um, the original seize began February 28th on 90, in 93, and it ended April 19th, 1993. Now, what's that date, April 19th? Same date the Murrah building was bombed. Well, okay, no coincidences, ladies. We've said this so many times over the 24 years on this program. There are no coincidences. Not like that. Yeah, and so there were 54 dead, including 21 children dead. But what what had happened, here, here's the bottom line. Um, the shadow government machine gunned those people. They, they were down. Most of them were dead by the time this happened. The feds waited for the windiest day. I mean, the wind was absolutely horrible that day. They went to the windward side. They uh, interjected some gas in a flammable thing, and they burnt that compound down to cover up the murders of American women and children. Okay, that's what really happened. Then Ron Cole, when they saw, the Branch Davidians saw that, this is what he told me. 
He said, we got scared shitless. We got so scared Mm -hmm. that they were going to come get us next. Mm -hmm. So they all disappeared. They left out of there, and they came up here to Colorado. Mm -hmm. And they rented a ranch. This stuff's never been out uh, into public before. And I thank you for your platform to get this truth out. He said they they rented a little uh, ranch way out in the mountains, and they were trying to buy some illegal automatic weapons. Mm-hmm. I had the largest machine gun shop here in the state of Colorado uh, previously. Mm-hmm. I did not meet Ron Brown or find out about it, but he picked up some MP5 machine guns illegally to uh, protect themselves because their buddies had all just been murdered and killed yeah. down there. And not they not Ron really Brown. Happened. What was his name again to get that straight? I mean, Ron Cole. I'm there sorry, you go. Ron Cole. It's all right. I want to make sure we got it right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. So what he told me next is this. Um, they were all laying low in this little place they'd rented, mm-hmm. and somehow the feds found out where they were. And he said that one night a, a, a team came in with black, all in black, and he had went out in the woods. They had some stuff stashed in the woods, and he went out to get it, and it was his blind luck. That's when the team hit. And he said they went in there and murdered several of the Branch Davidians that had run away after Waco, and he got scared, and he just ran in the woods, and he threw his gun down and just went off on his own to hide. So he got a fake passport, and he went up to Canada. Huh. It was an Algerian passport. This is mm-hmm. what he told me. Mm-hmm. And that he was fixing to go to Algiers the next day. He was going to disappear, you know, change his identity, change everything, and just fade away. He was lucky to be alive. He made one mistake, and he, his girlfriend down in Waco, he had to leave her in a hurry, and he was sad, and he ne- he knew he'd never come back to the United States, and he, he loved her, and he just wanted to tell her goodbye. So he called her cell phone. And the next day, he was scheduled to leave, to fly out. Uh, the FBI and the RCMP, that's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, mm-hmm. um, hit his place, and they arrested him and extradited him back to uh, the U.S., and they threw him in the pod at the FCI Correctional Institute where I was, Mm -hmm. and they threw him in there. I had been planted with evidence by this Blake Butler uh, cop who was at Waco. We got pictures of him. Um, He planted me with evidence to shut me up about Mm -hmm. all this stuff, Mm -hmm. and then Ron Cole came right in our pod, and I had a bunch of stuff about the Waco stuff that had been mailed in to me, and he saw it on the table, and he said, are you interested in that? And we started talking. He told me this stuff straight to my face, Mm -hmm. and so they got him on a uh, running away and then uh, planted a machine gun charge on him, and I don't know where he went after that. But he was scared to death inside that maximum security prison. He kept telling me, they killed my friends. I watched them murder them with the um, you know helicopter, and I know they're going to kill me. They're going to poison my food. He was just really paranoid. And I thought he was a little mentally unbalanced at first, but once I heard his story, yeah. uh, Jeff, he, he certainly yeah. had the right to be paranoid. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Th- That's this the is, story he told me. Yeah. It's never been out in public. That's amazing. I, it, they hunted those people down and killed them. That's they were witnesses. Did, Look yeah. what the Clintons do to the witnesses. What do yes. they do? They hunt them down and kill them. Yep. I started this program in, in 94, and I remember then one of the earliest things I was reporting on was the Clinton death list. And it seemingly has never stopped. How about the black guy, what, uh, last year? Uh, allegedly lifting a, a barbell and it fell and, and crushed his throat. Uh, at first they said he had a heart attack, but that wouldn't work with a crushed throat. So then they had to say, no, he dropped a barbell on himself. This is another person who used to work with the Clintons. It just goes on and on and on. You can, you can all look it up online if you want and read about it. Just enter Clinton death list. And it's probably a hell of a lot bigger than, uh, than I'll ever know, and Cody has a much better idea of this than I do. Jeff, I could do a two-hour show easily just in Arkansas. Well, well, let's yeah, uh, about, let's about let's, this stuff. let's put that on the on the ledger. I'd like to have you on as often as you want to come on and get as much of your life out there uh, for the record uh, as we can. This is this is truth time, America. Uh, we don't have time to play games anymore. It's now or never. Uh, no joke. The technology they have arrayed against us is is unbelievable and far down the road from what you'd imagine, unless you listen to this program all the time. 
Let's go to Benghazi. Are you sure you want to go there? I want to go there. <laughs> this this is something that needs to be done. And all of you listening, you're going to hear the real truth for the first time about Benghazi. No more lies. No more bullshit. This is the real deal. Please, go ahead. Okay. What I'm going to tell you is what was whispered into my ear. Um, this individual put his lips to my ear. He didn't want his lips red or any anything else. Uh, he was a Marine Corps in the Marine Corps for a long time, many years, and then uh, worked a little while with uh, Eric Prince's company, the Blackwater, as a contractor because you make a lot more money contracting. You know, I made a thousand, two thousand, three thousand a day sometimes, depending on what we were doing. Right. But anyway, it's high risk. You know, people go, oh, "That's a lot of money." Well, it's high risk. You can get killed and. A dead man doesn't care about money, but he he had went over to Benghazi and had become a CIA contractor. Okay, mm-hmm. he was there to provide support operational stuff around that embassy. And here's the story he told me. I cannot use his name. I know he's. I know everything. I just. I'm not going to use his name no, in don't. public. But please don't. Anyway, so Jeff, uh, here's what he told me. He said when that firefight broke out. They were. He was sitting in his in his uh, quarters, and they had radios and everything. And they heard uh, that there'd been a explosion and firefight. And um, he got his gear all ready and got his web gear on, was ready to go. And then the order came to stand down. And then they heard that there were air assets ready to help and assist our embassy personnel, and they were ordered to stand down. And this process went. And then he'd listen and listen on the radio. It got worse and worse. And then he'd want to go. Uh, they'd call in to request to go assist. They'd stand down. So this happened three times. And he told me, he said, you know, I'm a, a, a Marine. I took the oath to defend the Constitution. And I sat there and listened to all this stuff on the radio. And he said, I could not in good conscience let our men and, and people be killed. And so I said, you know, Blackwater be damned and CI be damned. And he knew he was going to lose his job. And he went running. And he got in a firefight for about seven hours. And he saw uh, some of those Navy SEALs that got shot. Um, he he saw them die. And he told me they, they blew off the uh, roof of the building with Soviet mortars. And just see, this goes back to Waco. You know how you blow off the top floors right. first? Right. Gotcha. You can collapse the perimeter. See, this is a standard uh, tactic. Now, now, before we go any further, here's here's another thing that he told me. He said that when we went in and we hit Gaddafi in Libya and Tripoli, that Gaddafi had big stores of gold bullion. He also had a lot of Soviet arms that he'd been buying. He was washing his oil money, oil revenues. Uh, with the Soviets, and they were trading him arms and gold. And I had a friend that's another associate. I cannot use his name. He had dinner with Gaddafi in the National Palace one time. And so he told me a, a lot of stuff about this. But um, So I got two sources on the ground right there. Obama and Clinton, they both looted the gold. Uh, not not personally. They had their their teams do it, black ops teams. Right. They looted the gold. Then they were taking the arms and funneling them through that embassy, and they were arming ISIS over in Syria. So the people over in Syria, you know, ISIS was butchering people, cutting their heads off, uh, blowing yeah. up the old ruins, you know, and yeah. all of the stuff, and it pissed all the people off. That's why they attacked our embassy. They were tired of us running guns to these people who were looting and raping their country. Huh. So they, at the night, they, they did all that. Our Navy SEALs got killed. The ambassador got killed. Uh, meanwhile, all our air assets, all the uh, help, were ordered down by the State Department because Hillary Clinton and Obama didn't want the American people to find out that they were secretly arming ISIS. ISIS was a creation of our own uh, uh, government, and then also looting the gold for themselves. So here, Clinton and Obama are getting rich. They're getting rich off the gold, while our men and embassy personnel are dying. That's what he told me. Now, 
Now, now, Jeff, this is gonna this is gonna be shock to your audience. I, it was a shock to me when I heard all this, and I told him. I turned around and whispered in his ear. I said, "Are you kidding me?" He said, "No, that's what happened." He said, "I know some guys that were moving that gold and stuff, but I never handled it myself. It's all hush hush." And um, that would make if this story is true. Okay, if it is true because I don't have any actual intelligence to, to verify. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why he would lie to me. Um, if this story is true, that means Obama, President Obama and, and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Clinton were both engaged in a conspiracy to commit treason against the United States of America and the Constitution of the United States. It means they were both involved in a treason, in a conspiracy to commit treason by letting our men die, by holding back deliberately assets that may have led to uh, them all being alive. And he was disgusted, and he told me, um, he says, I, I'm not supposed to say her name because he signed a uh, non-disclosure agreement. Yeah. Uh, a point specific mission specific agreement not to talk about that so he couldn't he couldn't go out in public but he could tell somebody like me and now I'm on out in public telling it but um, he said that he said she and I knew he meant Hillary Clinton but he didn't use her name he goes I can't use her name he said she is one lying bitch that's exactly what he said to me I I don't like cussing on the air Jeff I'm sorry about your show but these are, this is the truth this is what he said now, these people are the smartest audience in talk radio. They're, they're fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, now, now uh, just another amazing. thing. Uh, well, another you know, thing. The, the one quick thing, Cody. Yeah. I used to talk about the Clintons being mega millionaires. And I used to tell people, no, they're billionaires. Well, yeah, they're, they're washing, they wash drug money. Um, down in Centaur Rose in Arkansas, yeah. I was told by my higher-ups that there was about $100 million a month in cocaine going through there, and that Bill Clinton was getting $10 million a month as part of that black cop. His job was to use the position as governor uh-huh. to um, cover up all right. those ops. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and how much uh, of the $7 billion out of Haiti did they get? Uh, you know, you know damn well it was a pretty good chunk of it. I forget the, what was the kid, the kid's name who wrote the book about me. Now, Terry, uh, Terry something. T- Terry Reed. I think it was Reed. Yeah, Terry Reed was ex AFI Air Force Intelligence from Vietnam, and uh, he wrote that book called Compromise. That's it. The name of I it? used to have Terry on the program. Yes. Oh. Okay. Yes. Years ago. Yep. Uh, very interesting to put it mildly. Okay, go ahead. You're you're moving on. This is yeah, fascinating. Yeah, there was one more thing that I wanted to tell uh, that that they were talking about. Uh, this is bad as the USS Liberty, you know. Stand <laughs> Johnson stand down on that. Well, yeah. yeah, that that's the USS Liberty and the USS Turner joined the Gulf of Tonkin. Now I have yeah. eyewitnesses over there that were there. They were on the USS Warden. That was a guided missile destroyer, you know, with the air, uh, running cover for the Enterprise. They were running uh, air support missions in the highlands of Vietnam. But mm-hmm. that's a whole other story. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll talk right. about that later. Back to Benghazi. My source said that they had, you know, they watched civilian news uh, once in a while and that the wing camera footage of what they were showing us Americans over here on our, our media Obama and Hillary Clinton were keeping up the farce that that ISIS was our enemy, and we're trying to stop them. And Obama ordered, uh, you know, ISIS convoys to be attacked and all this stuff. The whole time, uh, our guys were flying off uh, aircraft carriers with missions in the area, and they had those big, long, 100-long 100, 100 Toyota trucks, you know, and, he, and they would have clear visibility. Mm-hmm. There was no jungle canopy like Vietnam. There was no mm-hmm. dust storms. They could see for miles, and they would get up close to hit an ISIS target and then call in for the green light to proceed with uh, ordnance delivery and uh, in order to stand down. Then they would come back to the carrier and standard procedure, drop the ordinance for you land, you know, to stop uh, crashes and stuff. And then they were ordered to sign national security agreements not to talk about it. 
And then what they did over here in our country was take the Russian wing stuff, the footage, mm -hmm. and substitute it for ours and then show the American people that we were hitting on. Ah, unreal. It's all treachery. It's all trickery. It's all deceit. It's lies. And they're I, looting the gold. They're looting the gold yeah, yeah, while yeah. our guys are doing I'm all dying. the dirty work. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, beyond despicable. I, I don't even have words for it. I don't. I, I think of that grinning Obama, and, you know, you just you just want to punch his lights out. He's, he's, he's such a disgusting human being. All the stories. Well, this is how the shadow yeah. government works. That's it. And the Americans, we're all over here working and paying our bills and taking care of our children and living good lives, trying to be good people. And these people at the top are totally, it's just, oh, what do I say, Jeff? What do we say? It this couldn't, is, I don't know. We run out of words. Uh, literally, I've run out of words many times. How do you explain something and we don't have the proper words for it? They've been used to death. Uh, these people are just as you said earlier. They are inhuman, Luciferian, satanic. They are not like we are. They are a different mindset. They have absolutely no morality, no spirituality. And I'm not to the point here where I'm willing to will out. I will not willingly rule out anything anymore as far as cause. I think that there's a possibility, and this may sound a little bit outlandish to you, Cody. I don't know that there may be some kind of off-planet evil involved here. Something, something's wrong at the top. These are, it's beyond uh, human behavior. It's that evil. It's, it, it just seems like there's something uh, going on that, uh, that doesn't normally register. I don't know, but it's that bad. Well, we're definitely not alone. Uh, in in this great vast universe, I mean, if if the Earth was the only uh, oh, life, what a joke that would be, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, so that you, that you may have been hitting on something, and that's another. So yeah, just, well, we'll we'll maybe talk about that too. I, I've been studying that very closely for over thirty years. Well, I flew the space shuttle simulator at NASA down there, the one the actual astronauts trained on. I was in the simulator, and uh, I got a lot of contacts and stuff yes. about that. Ah, uh, well, I'd love to talk to you about that sometime, too. Uh, Clark McClellan is a very good friend of mine in this program. He was a, a space shuttle uh, scientist down there for 32 years. Uh, he got to know the paperclip people. He, he learned a lot. Uh, he saw things uh, during shuttle missions he shouldn't have and talked about them, and they bounced his, his butt out. He got no pension. He's got nothing. He's living in Florida now, lost one leg to diabetes. And uh, we try to help Clark. He's been a friend for a long time. So, yes, I'd like to talk to you about that at some point, too. Benghazi. No accountability. Nobody pays the price except the dead. Hillary goes on to be presidential candidate. You must just about wretch at some of this stuff you see during the campaign. I, I was offered the job to bomb the Murrah building. I turned it down on patriotic grounds. They planted me with evidence. They threw me in prison for something I did not do. The judge, Nottingham, uh, was appointed by Director of Central Intelligence, George Bush. The prosecuting uh, U.S. attorney was Tom Strickland, appointed by Bill Clinton. Uh -huh. And then later, after my case, after all this happened, Judge Edward Nottingham in the Tenth Circuit got busted with a sex scandal with prostitutes. In my book, I have all the newspaper articles from the Denver Post, Rocky Mountain News. This federal judge was caught in a sex ring. He was using uh, his computer in the back chambers of the court and uh -huh. using his own credit card to order up all kinds of sex stuff. And, um, I, I mean... I had talked about Kathy O'Brien and the Clintons and, and Bush and the pedophile thing, and then I went in there, they buried all that, they took the tapes, mm -hmm. they broke every law there was, and then they stuck me in front of a judge who got later busted on a sex ring with prostitutes, mm -hmm. and this federal judge is one sex guy covering up for another sex guy. This uh, is where all does in it, this book. Where does it end? I don't know. I And you remember I the other... It. You did. And thank God you're still alive to tell it. When you start like this, Jeff, all you can do is laugh because the poor American people that are trying to do their best, they 
they're being duped and played so badly. It just it breaks my heart. I don't know what to do but laugh or cry. What are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. We got problems, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The only thing keeping this country as free as it is is our Second Amendment. Uh, our First Amendment's in grave jeopardy. If the Second is gone, we're gone. So we better fight. And I've, I've told people for years, Cody, I said, look, even if you don't want to own a gun, go get your concealed permit. Let the damn government know at least that you're applying and you care about the Second Amendment. Just get that permit. All right, where do you want to go from here? I'll tell you the truth about Project Slammer from 84 and 85. Uh, uh, it's a mind control program. After the CIMK Ultra thing, they morphed into uh, these higher level directed energy where they're using microwaves to uh, change the moods of people. I was directly involved in that, and I know so much. It was a 10-year study, uh -huh. and it was run by the NSA, the DIA, Navy and Air Force Intelligence. The main ones running it were CI and, B and FBI, Behavioral Science Division, right. and our uh, some spies we had, like Alter Chains and Robert Hansen, had defected to the Soviets. So it was built, sent, mm -hmm. sold to Congress as an op to uh, figure out why our spies were turning, mm -hmm. and then develop a psych a profile test to stop it. Mm -hmm. And then underneath that, the CIA turned it into an assassination program. So I was in a, in the black op of that. This is amazing. The people need to really hear this. So Jesus. they won't fall victim to it. Uh, is there anything they don't weaponize? No. This is the new stuff, this Project Slammer stuff. That's what killed me. I died in the hospital at the Soldier of Fortune show uh, out there in Vegas. We took a 50 grand worth of machine guns to do a shoot out there, and they hit me with it out there. I died in the... The civilian doctors had no clue what they were seeing. And I'll, I'll explain the whole thing and how it works. It's it's amazing information. If I'm still alive to do it, uh, we'll do it. Maybe we'll do a show on it. It's stuff you don't hear. They they keep all this stuff covered right. up. Uh, my my goal is to get this truth. I, I suffered horribly. I saw a lot of things. I want the American people to stand with me in the light, to step forward. Clearly, this is one of the most important books of of my lifetime. Cody, thank you. I don't know how to begin to thank you, but thank you. And uh, on behalf of everyone listening, uh, bless you and thank you very much for your bravery. And again, uh, tell your, your buddies outside that uh, they are appreciated too. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. All right. Good night.